In the northern part of the kingdom west, this is where Lion's Gate lies. Here the bird sings outside his nest as he greets the morning sunrise. In Lion's Gate, neath the tall fir trees, on your face feel the ocean breeze. Feel the magic that's in the air in Lion's Gate, the fair. Okay, welcome to our third installment of August Backyard Bardic with the Lion's Den. I am Baron Kinrick, and tonight I have the pleasure to introduce an integral member of this great barony of Lion's Gate. There is no greater agony, Maya Angelou tells us, than bearing an untold story inside you. We are, as Jonathan Gushal says, addicted to story. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories. Storytelling is how we guide children, how we inspire and teach greatness. It's how we bring dignity to a people, how we break it, and how it is healed again. Kevin McGareth Uwe Andreas is a man woven of stories, connecting our pasts, celebrating our shared present and looking to the paths ahead. He researches and tells the stories of our ancient history, holding fast to the roots while removing the layers of more modern history. We need storytellers because the SCA is built from our hearts down to our feet and is into the earth where our ancestors sleep. To be a storyteller is to know you will never die. To paraphrase Vera Nazarian, you will simply disappear into your own story. Let us disappear tonight with our very own courtier, Kevin, as our guide. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was, that was incredible. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little moved. Um, thank, you, thank you all of you for, for joining us here, um, joining me here. Um, as I said, as I, as I joined the, the Zoom session, just as we were about to begin, a bard arrives precisely when they mean to, um, which is usually much later than they would have liked to. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with my PowerPoint. Can everyone see that okay? Excellent, thank you. So, um, uh, sorry, just one, one moment here. My delightful partner was listening to my voice and it was throwing me off. Um, so what are we talking about today? Uh, as His Excellency, Excellency mentioned, we're talking about storytelling and myth-making, specifically uh, SCA-centric myth-making and storytelling. One of the things that I was really interested in when we started talking about this idea of having a series of bardic conversations, uh, especially in, in August, was this idea that our, our bardic arts are quite often a representation or um, a, re, a retelling of period performances, uh, whether they be poetry or song or music or storytelling or dance, any of these are, are considered bardic in my eyes. One of the things that we, we have sort of a mixed or inconsistent relationship with is, is the stories that we tell about ourselves or the stories that we tell about each other. When I started in the SCA um, 14 years ago, there, there were stories that I heard of people who were no longer around, people who had played five, 10, 15 years before I had started playing. And these felt like the stories that you would hear from 500 years ago or a thousand years ago. These are people that I had no connection with. I had never met. And as much as I could see in the eyes of the people who were telling me these stories, how connected they were, it was not something that I could personally connect with. And as I, as I started to become more involved in the SCA and, and I, I did things like I would enter heavy tournaments where you needed to bring a prize, um, the idea that I could maybe create history, create a story or a myth for somebody who I knew um, became very interesting to me. So one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at some of the stories and, and the texts that I've actually written, um, but I wanted to put all of this into a framework and the framework is, is going to be pedagogical by nature because that's the only way that my brain works anymore even when I'm on summer break. So let's go to 
our session outlines and key considerations. First off, um, we have to acknowledge that we are all learners on a path of growth. That means that we are going to review one possible model of composition, which includes, at least in this example or in this evening, um, some narratives and some epistolary. Um, we're going to highlight some examples of SEA focused texts that have been composed through period frames and, and tools uh, or lenses, lenses, excuse me. Um, and hopefully, we're going to have some fun. Uh, I see something pop up in the chat here. What is this? Perfect. Good. Hello, Chave. Um, OK, so moving on to our next slide. The, the society in, in every field is made up of amateurs and hobbyists and experts and academics and everything in between. I'm going to be including references to text composed by others, or at least that was my plan. It's just a series of links at the end because I had some wonderful bards who are far more, um, far more in depth and far more in touch with some of this culture from before I joined. Um, Brianna Cassia, Lancer Brianna, uh, gave me permission to share some of her texts. Unfortunately, they didn't end up in my PowerPoint in time. Uh, Master Wolfton Raviston gave me permission to share some of his texts. Again, they didn't end up in my PowerPoint in time. Um, and her ladyship Juliana from Seagirt also uh, gave me permission to share some of her texts because there is, there is a tradition of this in the SCA, although it's one that is, like I said, inconsistent. Um, uh, so I, I strongly encourage you, I'll share the links at the end, I strongly encourage you to go and take a look at these other pieces of text, because I don't want my perspective and my input and my examples to be the only ones that you work from any more than you would limit yourself to a single author. Um, so as we progress, uh, questions, comments, and input will be solicited throughout the evening. Um, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. But if you're if you're adding comment or to to reinforce or to add on to a point that I make, if you can wait until we stop for a moment to have the discussion, I get very easily distracted by seeing chat windows pop up. It's again one of the the byproducts of being a teacher online. Do me a favor. <laughs> um, okay, and this this last part is is super important. It was actually the first thing that I wrote on this slide. I'm not an expert in any of the content that I'm discussing this evening. Um, I enjoy telling stories. I enjoy making the, the people around me and my friends heroic, but I'm always ready to learn more. And I think that it's important that we always remember that the things that we know are constructed. These are pieces of information that we've gained and they should always be changing. So please do not feel like you need to, to, to keep yourself quiet if I've said something wrong or different from what you understand, because we're gonna combine our knowledge together. Um, this is going to be my first point where I stop and see if anybody has any questions or comments that they'd like to have as a part of the discussion. There's your teacher wait time. Okay, moving along. Oh, I saw something pop up. See how fast that was? Keep going. Thanks, Alvina. Um, okay, so for our purposes, what are myths? Um, for our usages here, myth is standing in for a variety of oral and written traditions that include elements of stories with people as main characters, showing a lesson or a virtue. Sometimes in anthropology and sociology, those are called folk tales. Uh, stories to explain the world around us and the, why, the reason why things happen. Those are subcategorized as myth. And stories that are grounded in reality, but taken to a hyperbolic or a fictionalized level. And again, those are subcategorized as legend. So I'm going to use uh, myth for the most part throughout the course of my presentation, but understand that in, in the technical academic sense, there are differences. Okay. So why do they matter? Um, just as cultural narratives were critical in period, all periods, all places, all times, um, in different forms, of course, the, the use of SEA centric stories in an SEA context allows us to come together as a community and to create touchstones of prominence where an individual or a group is highlighted for their actions, either good or bad, depending on what the lesson is supposed to be. Okay, excellent. We've got a question. This is a good pause. I like, I like checking at the end of each one of my slides. What can I do for you, my friend? I believe this is Abin Ibn Khalid from Atlantia. Hi, welcome. If you feel like typing it in, I can, I can answer it when I have the next pause. Uh, so what do we do with the no beep there I was stories? Uh, that's a great example. I'm actually going to, the very first text that we talk about tonight is going to be an example of one of those that 
has, has become a new thing or a different form? Great question. I'm glad that you thought about that. Um, sorry, the question was, what do we do with the, the it's okay, we can swear here, the, the no shit there I was stories. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about one. So in, in my framework, I, I wanted to try to simplify this down because one of the things that I would like people to leave tonight with is a feeling that they too can compose their own SCA-centric mythologies. Um, the three steps for me to writing a Scadian myth were to find a period mechanism, whether this is a form or a style or a set of conventions, narrative elements, cultural ideas, something that you can pull from period as your touchstone. Identify a worthy subject from the people and the happenings around you. This is what makes it an SCA story. These are things that happen in the SCA. And weaving different kinds of SCA elements together with your real elements and your period foundation. If you're following these three, you should be able to put together something that is both new, is a, a real touchstone that somebody can, can, can connect to if they were at the event or they know the person, but also has echoes of, of period style. So let's take a look at what we're gonna be looking at. Um, I've broken this up into several different parts or, or um, angles. The first three that we're gonna take a look at are heroes in the making. So there are two stories and a song. Um, the first story is Dana Koika or Dana Wanai. The second is related to that. It's almost a prequel. It's called The Wooing of Sasha. Um, and then the third of that first set of heroes in the making is a chant I wrote for Prince Alfgar during one of his reigns. Um, following that, I've got two epistolaries that I've written, um, war letters. One of the things that was brought up while we were discussing whether or not um, I would end up hosting this evening was that there is a, um, a presumption that I'm a war bard. And it's true. There were, there were two instances where I was able to write something sort of in this framework, sort of using these tools and, and strategies that I suggested to you to, to increase engagement in an SEA event by making it seem like something that we were all a little more connected to than maybe we had felt like we were before. Making it part performance, part, uh, part period representation. Um, and then the very last thing that I have is, is almost, a, almost like the first three, almost like a hero in the making, but because of what I used as the foundation, the period foundation template, uh, it, it is a very different kind of category. I call this rewriting history. So, these are the, the six pieces that we're gonna look at briefly. I did not copy the text directly into the PowerPoint, but I figured we can always pop over into the on-tier Wikipedia, where all of these texts are recorded in a category called Songs of the Storm Thrones, because I was originally thinking that these were gonna be tier E focused, but they could be on tier in as well. It's, it's in, invaluable to make sure that when you compose a new text, it is easily accessible. Master Wolfstan has, a, I believe it's a, it's a WordPress, where he puts all of his original compositions. But the other two folks that I spoke with about including their texts, they're, they're still in the process of, of collating, combining. Some of them were, were in the process of typing the, the handwritten text that they had access to or that they had written themselves. I cannot tell you how often I go back to the Ontario Wikipedia page to find my own stories <laughs> because I don't have them written down anywhere else. This was a... Um, an attempt to try to collectivize and, and combine these stories so that anybody who felt like they were interested could take a text, just like I take texts about Ku Cullen that I have not written, and I perform them around bardic fires. If somebody wanted to tell the story of Dana Koika, they could find the original text, they could take it to the event, and they could perform it exactly as it is. That was actually one of the elements of period foundation that I put in. If we get a chance to take a look at some of my stories on the Ontario Wikipedia later, they are all they are all signed with my name and one of the one of the phraseologies that we often find in um, in rune stones or in augum stones where it's 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 stated who it was placed on the stone with or by, um, and that is again just sort of part of that framing that you can take the story as it is, and even though it's about something that happened in 2014. It, it can be presented as if it is a period story. Okay, uh, before we start to actually look at some of these texts and the way that I unpack my method of composition, do we have any questions? I know that there are several people here who know Dana and Sasha, who know Alfgar and were present for some of these events. One of the things that I was looking at as I looked at my own texts and the texts that were shared with me is the idea of generational cycles. It's 
it's still a rough idea. I have not managed to iron out all of the details in it, but I believe that we exist in a, in a roughly 10 year cycle. Um, there are people who are playing in the SEA now who have been playing for a couple of years who do not know about the people that I tell stories about. And similarly, there are people who tell stories about people that I've never met. And there are going to be people who hopefully see this now or in recording, take, take my, my divine wisdom and manage to write stories about people I haven't met yet. All of that is valuable and all of that is a part of the cultural creation of knowledge and story. Uh, some SEA based folks do a lot of these SEA myths. Yes, Shave, both of those are fantastic examples. Um, because they're not focused on a specific individual, or at least Squire to the King is not, that's the only one that I've heard performed. Um, I did not use those as, as examples, but those are good points to add, thank you. Um, okay, moving on to our next slide. Oh, now I got some more popping up here. Actually it was, but. Uh, it, towards the end, when we have our, our discussion, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how, how we can connect that to the, to the living person or the living event. Okay, so uh, the compositional elements in Dana Koika. So if we, if we remember back the three different pieces that I discussed being a part of, of my, my method of, of composing SEA myths, um, the period foundation. So there are a couple of different things that show up in the story. And, and like I said, down here at the Ontario Wikipedia, we can pop over and take a look at it. Um, but the three elements that I particularly wanted to draw attention to are the Aristea, which is a scene in epic poetry, particularly um, a classical epic poetry, where the hero has their, their best moment, their most heroic moment. Um, the story of Dana Koika, where he gets his name, uh, Dana Wanai, is, is his most heroic moment. Um, there is a, a lengthy section of, of the arming description, which again is something that comes from classical epic poetry. Um, the, the text or the, 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 the succinct description that I pulled out was that it sheds light on the following battle and conveys information on the character of the fighting hero. Uh, and then there are four wonderful references to that in the Iliad. In Dana Koika, the, the arming scene is directly tied to the, the reality. And then this idea of a geis or a geisa. Um, in Celtic cultural concept of a, a cursed gift um, or a predestiny or predestination. Um, these can be known or unknown to the hero, but if they are not followed, there are always drastic consequences. Um, and sometimes the following of the guys is the drastic consequence because they are, they are necessities, they are uh, logical consequences. So what are our, our real world focuses? Um, the real world focus is, is on Dana, Dana Rani, um, who's a real person. And the accoutrements that he wears um, are similar to in the arming scene. And his war hounds, his war hounds, uh, Cricket and Sprocket, both, both very real dogs. Um, and they show up in the story as, as secondary figures as well. What are some of the SEA elements that we've included here, or I've included, starting to use the royal we? Um, the Avakaltiri War. So the very first Avakaltiri war that we had, and this is where, this is where I, I get to, to highlight a wonderful confluence of events. So I was, I was at, at War I. Um, during, during the pre-war melee, uh, my good friend Dana um, was struck in the helmet and the bar grill on his helmet was adjusted out of place ever so slightly so that it was actually a little wider in the gap than the combat arrow arrowheads. Nobody noticed because we had done all of our inspections before the melee. And then once we, we actually march off into the battle, there was quite a bit of marching. I remember at the time joking that it felt a lot like real war because there was a lot of marching and very little fighting. Um, but at one point, and this is, this is the reality of the story, at one point, um, a combat arrow manages to just find that sweet spot perfectly between the bar, um, the bar grills in, in his helmet. And horror, right? To see somebody walked off of the war field with an arrow sticking out of their helmet and the immediacy of how much can we pack? How quickly do we pack? Who's taking care of the dogs as Sasha takes them to the hospital to find out if there's any permanent eye damage? Um, good news, no permanent eye damage. Um, even better news, it gave me a fantastic base for a story. So, I had, been, um, I had been in the SEA about eight, nine months at that point, 
and I was getting ready for my, my courtier trials. And one of the things that I needed to do at that point in the framework of the courtier trials at that time was to tell a period story and a period-esque story or period style story. So I told a very quick story about Kukulin and Senbeck and a little man in a boat. And then I wrote this story about my friend Dana. And I'm gonna take you over and just, we're gonna take a quick look at this text. There we go. Can everyone see Dana Koika on the Ontario Wikipedia there? Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at how some of the elements that I discussed show up. Um, we have Dana and his hounds, Cricket and Sprocket. These are our real world focuses. Um, we have him outperforming the salmon feet, the deer feet, and the oxen feet which are literal feats of heroism and strength and athleticism that show up in different Celtic stories, uh, particularly the Irish stories that I have as my basis. Um, and then this is the section that I really wanted to draw attention to. This is the arming. So he has a great torque of iron wider than his head sat upon his neck. He wore an enar, which is a, a padded leather jacket, um, padded with the wool of his herds and bound with the hides of his herds. Upon his feet, he wore boots woven with silver and clasped with the antlers of a great stag. Overall, he wore a coat of the Oost fashion. Um, Oost is the, the name for the Vikings for the Irish because they didn't come from the north, they came from the east. Um, so it's a Norse coat. Uh, for though he was a proud son of Alba, right, Scotland, uh, he bowed to no flag. And in his hands, he had an axe of the same mode, so a Danish axe, a Viking axe. Uh, upon his back, he lay the great round shield of his wife's father and the spears of his house. Um, Kinrick, is that a fairly accurate description of how he used to dress in his armor? That's... Pretty much him, yep. Right? So it's, it's again, taking these real elements and then, and then just sort of slightly periodizing them or slightly mythologizing them so that we have something that you can directly connect to. You can tie it into a real event that happened and it has period flavor, period style, period element, period foundation. Um, moving down, there's, there's a, a little bit of back and forth as he, he comes to Atwar and he's, he's bringing himself to the front. And then this is the part that I wanted to bring our second piece of attention to. So he's, he's, he's challenging the Avicalian champion to one-on-one -on -one combat. Um, and he, he says all sorts of wonderful things that, that aggravate and upset the, the Avicalian. Uh, Ill-tempered, the Avicalian charged at this, throwing himself at Dana. Like a hawk from one breeze to another, he moved aside. The dragon's champion struck himself upon Dana's outflung spear, passing it through his helm, carrying an eye out upon its tip. In terror, he scrambled back between his men, leaving one eye gazing back at Dana. Dana watched the Avacal arrows crowd the sky and reached up. When he was born, the Druids gave little Dana a single gaze. This is that cultural element that we're bringing in, this blessing, curse, predestiny element. The boy was told that he was never to give without also receiving, and that he was never to take without also giving. And with that, Dana snatched an arrow from the sky and deftly plucked out his own eye. And this is why we call him Dana Choyka. So working, working the, the, the necessity of this exchange and this transaction into how he gets his name so that it's not an accident, it's not a tragedy, it's not a misfortune. This is something that makes him a hero by following through on the thing that was prescribed to him as a baby. So that's one example. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, um, before I continue on, I noticed that there are a couple here in the chat. Let's see if there's, uh, oh, what are letters I can see? Okay, in case I lose to my solutions. Yes, those are both excellent, right? Um, we're gonna talk at the war letters in, in just a moment. And yes, I think that the Geisa, the boons, the curses, this idea of a metaphysical, wherever it comes from, you're signing off the damn pieces. Thank you. Um, wherever wherever it comes from, it it, allows us to tell story because story quite often, especially in period, was not firmly grounded in reality. One of the greatest examples I have of that is a, is a university course I took where we were exploring, um, we were exploring the, uh, the classical era, but rather than exploring the classical era through the traditional Roman and the Greek eyes, we were looking at it through the Celtic and the Germanic eyes. And one of the things that we talked about was the difficulty disentangling this, the narratives that we have, the texts that we still have in existence. So there's a great example of a battle. I can't remember. I always want to say Clontarf, but it's not Clontarf. There's a, there's a battle where we know this battle happened. 
We know that the people and the, the, the elements that are in the story were real. But in that exact same story, without missing a beat, there are references to bouncing flaming skulls, which is less likely to be accurate. Never, exactly, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So we, we have always played around with this idea of, of reality versus fiction and, and what is and what isn't real. So throwing some of that stuff in as almost as your, your period element on top of an SEA narrative, excellent, excellent. Okay, so let's look at our next one. The Wooing of Sasha is a companion piece to Dana Koika. Um, what are our period foundational elements, origin stories? There are countless examples of tales that go back and fill in events of a hero's life from before they were famous or before they were heroic. Um, mythic quests. In the story, Dana is asked to perform a series of heroic feats to win the day and, and his prize and his future wife. And, and the idea of the people before, especially in Celtic stories, but in many other cultures as well, there are strong elements of pre -cul precursor cultures remaining. Um, Shea Mounds, even in the, in the 21st century in Ireland, are still a fantastic example of that. There are references in the wooing of Sasha to the giants and the fear below and the, the, the progression of peoples who existed in an area before humans did. Now, we can use our critical thinking and our rational minds and, and identify that these are probably examples of a new group of, of people, a new culture or a new tribe or civilization or, 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 or type of person moving in and othering whoever had been there first, um, either othering in story or um, eliminating and then othering in memory. There are lots of different ways to interpret um, the classical five waves of invasion in Ireland, but there are lots of elements of this idea that there is an older time, um, an older an older people that have have power, if not prominence anymore. So. Um, what are the what are the real world elements? Sasha, Sasha is a real person. She was really married to Dana, um, and I think that the story fairly describes the the relationship dynamic that they had, um, and it was part of the impetus to write this story because Dana got to have his heroic moment, right? Dana got to be shot in the air in the eye with an arrow, and everything turned out okay, and it was great. And for a little while, he, everybody had this story that they could tell about Sa uh, Dana, and and seeing seeing the work that Sasha put in behind, behind the scenes made it important for me to be able to, to, to raise her up and elevate her as well, to put her on, a, on an equal footing with her, her combat ho hero husband. Um, again, Dana is a real person. This is his prequel, but it's not his story. This is Sasha's story, even though it follows Dana. Um, and again, Cricket and Sprocket, real dogs, real adorable dogs. Um, this tale involves very few references to the SCA, but it exists as a companion piece to Dana Coy. So we're not gonna take a look at that one um, directly because I just noticed what our time frame is like, but there is a link to it. And again, um, on the Ontario Wikipedia and the Songs of the Storm Stones, or if you look up, you just look up Sasha or wooing, um, you'll be able to take a look at this text. And if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'm, I'm happy to read any of these or, or to, to display and show any of these. Any particular questions about our first two stories, uh, Dana Koika and the wooing of Sasha? How much was the wooing of Etain an inspiration? Very little, I'll be honest. Um, it, it, was, it was thematic inspiration, uh, but, but very little of the narrative and the elements carried across. Great question though. See, and that's, that's why I love, I love starting a thing with saying, I'm, 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 not, I'm not an expert, because that gives an opportunity for people who do know a little bit more to share. Thank you. Uh, okay. Moving along, this is the last of, in our first set, this idea of making heroes. So what are our period elements here in the chant of Alfgar? Um, the, the idea of, of once and future royal. Um, so examples from diverse cultures of cherished leaders returning during times of strife. I'm, I'm gonna put no money down on the fact that somebody will be able to tell us what the classic example of this is. Does anybody wanna throw that in? Here's the interactive section. Arthur. Yes, yes, King and Arthur, right? Once a future king. Um, that, that, is, that is our touchstone, right? Especially as the SEA, um, based on that, that, that Victorian ideal of the Arthurian romances. Um, I, I really like this, this song because it was a very different style for me. And we are going to take a look at the text. But keep in mind that idea of, you know that they were here, you know that they were good, you know that they had to leave. 
So what can we build on for them to come back? Uh, and at the time when I wrote this, it was, um, I don't know if anyone has seen the, the, the computer generated or the, the computer sort of masked uh, Beowulf that Neil Gaiman had a, had a hand in writing. There are lots of fantastic elements in that that have really strong period sources. And, and I, was willing to, I was willing to hope that some of the Bardic in the beginning, especially the, the Mead Hall songs, were, were based on similar sort of styles. And, and that's what I based mine on. It was a very simple beating pattern. Um, our real world focus here, Ulfgar. Prince Ulfgar, uh, His Excellency Viscount Ulfgar, is a real person. Uh, he was really Prince of Thierry, uh, especially when I wrote this. Um, and I think after I wrote it, he ended up winning again, but I can't remember the order, the order of events. He's been, he's been Prince several times. So there is that, that sense of cyclicality. Um, and then the last piece, the SEA elements. These, these are the, the places and the people. So the SEA elements in this song point to the rotating system of royals that we use, but it masks the change as a part of a changing world and as a predestined hope, right? We, we don't really have a lot of examples of someone being royal, not being royal, and then being royal again that aren't attached to a very strong supernatural uh, element. Yes, yeah, the idea of Christ coming back is also a fantastic example. Thank you. Uh, not where I would have gone, but yeah, absolutely. That's a that's that's probably where the Arthurian is based as well, right? Uh, yes, yeah, see do Paul. Yep, yeah, do Paul's a great example. Um, but Alvina, this is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of our generational differences. Um, I know I know of the Bellatrixes. I have met Duke Paul, but that that lineage, that line, that history, I've I've heard the stories more than I have experienced the human beings. So we talk about war letters text? Back to you. Uh, yes, we absolutely are. We're just looking at three of, of, of our first set of texts and then there's two war letters and then there's one more text at the end, my friend, don't worry. Um, okay, so let's take a, a look at the, uh, at the chant of Alfgar real quick. Did the screen share change over? Can everyone see the Wikipedia again? No. Mm. I gotta practice my screen sharing technique. Here we go. How about that? Excellent. Okay, so this is just a nice quick one. So we're gonna run through this, right? Once before I sang this song, but all the words came bent and wrong. So if I try and sing again of Ulfgar, prince of gods and men, forgive my tone and slurry words and pound your feet in cups and swords. Long before I reached this land, a prince stood tall with sword in hand. He fought the east and south and north and taught them all of Tyri's worth. But then he turned and left us then, destroying all the hopes of men, not knowing if he would return or leave his lands and towns to burn. From swamp and south he did appear and took away all doubt and fear. Women knew had found their voice. Men cried out and did rejoice for Alfgar had come again. But he's bound to leave once more, chasing foreign gems in war miles long and years from home, destined but to sack in Rome. But when our sky is dark as night, he will return and make things right. And it's just a cute little thing that you can do, especially in a banquet or a, or a hall, um, if people can be making noise and pattern along with you. There are little elements thrown in there that imply that I'm supposed to be drunk while I'm performing it, which was not often untrue. Uh, but you can see that the, the references here are are to Thierry, to Alfgar, but also to our geography, our geography here in, in southern Thierry in particular. Um, Alfgar was, was residing in Thornwood at the time, so that's, that's our swamp in south, um, and all of the sort of, uh, the, the awareness of place and presence comes in here. Okay, back to my power. Okay, so this is the last of our, our section on making heroes. Do we have any questions about those? Um, Dana Koika, Dana One Eye, the wooing of, of Sasha and the chant of Alfgar. Okay, moving right along. War letters. So there are there are two examples here, and, and because they were a little bit of a different style, they're not so much stories as they are um, texts that I wrote using a similar framework. How welcome are these types of pieces around bardic fires or in competition? That's an excellent question. Um, and thank you for the, the perfect timing of it because we're gonna talk about um, something else in a moment. So this is a great, a great time for that. 
how welcome are they around bardic fires? Uh, I've traditionally found them to be quite welcome. Um, if I'm if I'm at a, uh, the first time I performed at the Chant of Alfgar was literally at a, a teary garlic themed banquet. So it was a perfect setting for that. Um, I've done I've done Dana One Eye and the Wooing of Sasha several times around Bardic Fires, but I've not entered them in formal competitions at all. Depending on what kingdom you exist in, um, what the theme of the competition is, it's very important to make sure that you're you're following the expectations. If it's a excuse me, if it's, an, it's a bardic competition where um, period style is acceptable, wonderful. Um, if it's one where you have to document where you got the text and how it was used in period, it wouldn't work um, because they're not they're not period stories. Um, but as long as the the leeway is open for them. Um, I would I would love to see more things like this stories of ourselves presented in in competition. Um, and I'd like to see more of them written than just mine. Thank you for that question. Okay, uh, back to the back to the war letters. If you have more on that that you'd like to ask, definitely follow up with me when we get to the end. Okay, so war letters. What is our period foundation here? Um, well, there are lots of letters that were written in period. Um, period epistolary. There are um, there are lots of wonderful reference letters at Dragon Bear. I remember finding that particular website about a dozen years ago when I started doing this. Um, the two that I included as most sort of representative of the style and elements that I used in my own war letters were one from Conrad writing to the letter of, uh, writing to the Abbot of Corby in 1148, talking about the, the, the German failures in the, Cru the Second Crusade. Um, and then Frederick II's letter to Henry III of England in 1229. Um, both of those and their links are, are wonderful. And I strongly encourage you to go and take a look if you have any interest in the way that letters were written in period. There are several different cultures, although because of the, the, the timing of the source and the focus of the Pope person who wrote it, most of them are, are sort of mid to late uh, period and mostly Northern and Western European. Um, so I, I do apologize for that. I don't have a resource to talk about others. Uh, What's a war letter? That's a, you know what? I haven't even started with that. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, what's a war letter? Let's take a look at one. Let's take a look at one. So the very first war letter that I ever wrote um, was to Avacal when they were still a principality within the, the kingdom of Tier uh, of Volunteer. So at uh, Twelfth Night in AS44, a good friend of mine, uh, Giv, who's a, an archer, wrote a very, a very short missive, as you can see here, um, directly to the archers of Thierry um, when he was royal archer of Avacal, asking that the archers of Thierry stay home because they would be grossly outclassed by, by the Avacalians. And it took me a little bit of time. Um, but I, I, I took a look at some period resources and, and some period examples, and I, I was able to magic up. Um, so this letter is in the time of the Ontario Rebellion. No, my friend, not quite. Um, the Ontario Rebellion was actually uh, pre predates me, and this is another one of those generational I heard stories thereof. I know people who were involved in it, but because I didn't have that touchstone, it was it was difficult for me. Um, this is, uh, we're talking about AS44 would be 2009-ish, uh, 8-9. Um, so definitely after after the rebellion. Um, okay, so we have this this short little missive from my friend over in our neighboring principality, and then the response. So this response has several elements. First off, the um, the the full and complete addressment of every noble relevant. So we have the at the time uh, prince and princess of Avacal. We have their their Tannis, their heirs, uh, Helen and Warner. Um, and then we have three sets of barons and baronesses so that every person who would have been included in the missive, who would have received this respectful um, um, letter is directly addressed. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to start playing with the ways that you describe them, right? Um, not at, at this point, Vic and Inga had been uh, king and queen of Ontir, so they were once rulers of Ontir. Um, Tuck and Wilma, who I actually had had, had a relationship with, I threw a little bit of a, a nicer sort of language in with them. Again, none of this is meant to be um, none of this is meant to be harassing. None of this is meant to be bullying. The people who I spoke about um, in any way were people that I already knew, and if I didn't know them, I just gave them very um, uh, very um, very neutral 
or very understandable adjectives. I did not at any point meet Grimwolf and Desiring. So I was able to, to say that they were um, they were they were um, preserving Mergen Wood, but I did not speak to about them as, as people because I didn't know them. Um, then we get into get into this idea that there were there were words that were that were sent to Thierry from Avacal. This is the first thing that we need to address because this is not a letter that's coming out of nowhere. This is a response to an, an actual event that occurred in the SEA from real people at real times. And then we get we we play a little bit of fun with it. So I'm telling them not to not to consider what the the material costs of coming to to fight us and and inevitably losing will be. I'm asking them to think of the children. Because of course we would treat them well, but none of them deserves to be orphans because foolish people have said foolish words. And then we tie our real world examples and our SCA elements in again. So two years before, this is leading up to Avakal Tiri War Three. So two years before at Avakal Tiri War One, we had a hero made. Dina One Eye emerged from that, and Avakal did not win. Um, the second year, we had a, a very cute heavy war scenario where we pretended that some of the some of the fighters were were zombies. So there's a mention here of an undead scourge, because these are the sorts of things where if you were there, or you heard about it, or you knew about it. This story now has far more resonance with you. These are the SEA real world elements that we're including into something larger, something that we can perform. Um, so again, finish with humor. Think of the children. That's our very first war letter that we're gonna take a look at. And it had the kind of impact that you could only hope to have from a war letter. Um, the princess of Avacal at the time put a bounty on my head. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm glad that there are people here who can, who can speak of those events that were before my time. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So um, we have our period foundation, we have our real world focus. So the first war letter was about the Avacal Thierry War. And the second war letter that I wrote was about the Sea Lion War, which is between the Barony of Lionsgate and the Barony of Seagirt in, in Thierry. So what, what are the SCA elements here? Um, the SCA elements partly come from the way that they're presented and performed. So the Avacal ch challenge was delivered to the principality, like I said, with such an impact that there was a bounty placed on my head by their princess. Um, and then the Scourge of Secret letter was actually presented at court. Um, and it was, uh, it was calligraphied onto a scroll. The scroll was wrapped around an arrow in Barony of Lionsgate colors, and it was delivered to the Baron before the war began. And we can take a look at that one again. Again, just a nice, a nice short because these are not these are not lengthy performances. One of the things that you'll notice is that all of my pieces are are short enough to uh, hopefully avoid wearing thin. Um, the last thing that you want to do is is to claim a lot of space and a lot of time for people who don't want to be there. Uh, this is an experience that I have quite a bit when I'm a teacher, and and it's one of those things that you always want to fight. You always want to try to get away from. Okay, I am gonna I'm gonna pull a teacher moment. So you remember what I said about throwing a bunch of stuff in the chat that isn't a question? I get distracted. Um, okay, so just taking a quick look at the scourge of Seagirt. Um, what are our period elements here? We're using our epistolary, um, our foundation. Uh, and then what are our real world elements? Well, Baron Griffin. Baron Griffin was Baron at the time. Um, he was our dread bearded Baron. Um, and we have thankfully had a return of a dread bearded baron. So I may have to write some more letters for him. Um, but we have we have references to Astraea and Twelfth Night. Um, we have references to uh, daffodils and pleasantries because daffodil is a secret event that happens right before. So it is it is tied into this sense of place and time and people. Um, and we use some period elements. We use we use some kennings. We call each other whale brothers. We call each other lion brothers. Um, and it's it was just a cute, really fun way to have. Um, two branches pretend to get angry at each other because as much as we we have our, our wars and, and sometimes tensions can kick up, 
there isn't that sort of animosity between between branches and between people, which is good. I never I never legitimately want that. What I love is the performance and the pretend of an actual grievance against somebody. As much as I love the pretend killing that we do in, in combat, the pretend reason to do so, I think is just as important. And it can fire up armies like crazy. So those are those are the two war letters that we're going to take a look at. Does anybody have any questions about that section of the of the presentation? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just for the all of it, right? And and any of those things that you can have as as your hook, your emotional hook to be there, right? You love fighting. You love being with your friends. You love all of those things. But why do you really have to nail that person? Well, because they're from Seeger, obviously. <laughs> um, has anyone taken this sort of performance provocation personally? That's a great example. Um, if anyone has, they haven't spoken to me about it. Everyone that has ever been engaged with it, either by directly being called out, directly addressed, or part of the performance, or simply being in the audience for the performance. Anyone who's ever engaged with a text that I've written, one of these two war letters, seems to seems to have been very positively received. Um, when I say that that Avocal put a bounty on my head, at the time, um, Gemma, Gemma and I were, were chatting about this regularly. Um, Gareth, the, the fellow who started that with with the letter about the Tyri archers. Again, we were we were all in communication. Um, the one thing that I will say is that make sure make sure you get your permissions. Um, I, I mentioned that a little bit when I was talking about the stories of making heroes, you don't want to tell a story about somebody who doesn't want a story to tell about them. You don't want to tell a story that puts somebody in a light or a perspective they don't appreciate. And you don't want to speak for a group without permission to do so. So when I wrote the letter, um, when I wrote the letter about Sea Lion War between Lionsgate and Seagirt, I made sure that I got approval from the Baron and Baroness at the time. When I wrote the letter about the Avakal Tiri War, I made sure that I got permission from the Prince and Princess at the time. Um, that does not guarantee that there won't be people who misread and misunderstand. After the Avacal letter, um, because it was addressed from the archers of Avacal to the archers of Tiri, my response came from the prince of Tiri back. There were people, or there was, a, there was one member of the Tiri archery community who was upset with me for speaking for him. Um, but if you'd like, you can always go back and take a look at the, the text and, and it's clear that I'm not speaking for the archers. I'm speaking at behest of the, the prince. Um, and I explained that to him and, and later on when some things in his life had calmed down, he seemed to understand better. But that's a great question. Yeah, thankfully, thankfully I've never had anybody come at me um, afterwards with a negative reaction. It has happened to work. Yeah, I absolutely believe that it could. Um, I think I'm, I've, I've been both lucky and careful to make sure that nobody is ever put in a in a in a negative light. Okay. Oh, I'm doing okay for time. Nice. Back to our PowerPoint. Le Chasson de Jure. Where is he? Is he still got his camera on? There he is. This story has a story. Um, a very good friend of mine told me that he he appreciated my stories. He he liked the performances that I gave around Bardic Fires and that there were times when I could make people shocked, uh, pro provoking provoking wars and and upsetting the populace. There were times when I could make him laugh, um, whether I was telling a, a cute funny story about Kukulin or doing one of my my Bardic um, improv game shtick things, uh, telling a story about Concho Bear, great big green mossy bear. Um, any, any of these things were, were pleasant for him, but he wanted to challenge me. He said he wanted me to, to, to tell a story that would make him cry. And it, it took me a while, but I did. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna unpack a lot of this because I'd like to actually take a look at the text that exists on the Ontour Wikipedia. So what is our period foundation? The actual period story, uh, epic, epic tale, the, the Song of Roland, the Chanson de Roland, which is a, a medieval French tale. And it involves many different pieces that do not make their way into my story. 
Um, but it is it is undeniably the foundation that I use so much so that I wanted to make sure that I uh, I credit the translation that I use when I post it. Um, it is it is a direct rewrite of sections of the Song of Roland. What is our real world focus? Jure. Master Jure, Order of the Pelican, Companion of the Pelican, who has made such an impact on the kingdom and the principality in particular that there was no way that this story could not end the way that it does. And again, what are the SCA elements? Um, the Kingdom of the West, the Kingdom of Ontir, various branches in Tiri and Ontir, the people and the places named are our SCA connection here. So let's take a look at the Song of, of Jure. The framing device that I use here is a little bit different because again, I'm not taking something that existed in period and using it as a model to write something new. I'm literally rewriting something that existed in period. So my framing device here is that I understand my cousins in Frankia tell a tale of loss and legacy. This is a story of betrayal and greed, a story where good men die and wicked men are punished. This is a story of stubbornness and folly masquerading as chivalry and nobility. I find it peculiar and insulting to know that the tale of a true event has been dressed up to serve such a purpose. The ennobling of a fool named Roland and the stooge named Charles. I find myself compelled to tell you of the true event, to tell you the song of Jure. So what, I, what I've done at the beginning of this presentation is, is framed the idea that the Song of Roland in the documented period text that we have is actually a piece of propaganda. And it, it itself is a rewriting and a repainting of something that I would like to tell you is true about a very good friend of mine who really exists. So much like it is in the, in the style, and I'm, I apologize because I, I had wanted to find my text so that I could show you the parallels between these two texts. Um, but there are, there are just a couple of elements here that I'd like to point out. So we start off again, we're talking about the King of, of Ontir and the King of the West and the Lion's Army. These are our SEA elements that initially or um, uh, uh, immediately put us in place. They, they create our touchstone. We know the West, we know Ontir. Um, we know that the Lion's Army is the one that we're cheering for. Um, again, several of the, the period foundational elements, because this is a rewrite of the translated text that I have from period, many of these things, the, the language is, is what I've, I've used to create the period style. Um, we have another, another element of arming and our preparation for the battle. We have text that is, is almost verbatim from the original text, but is framed into, uh, sorry, let's, let's un, uh, rewind. For those who are un, unfamiliar with the Song of Roland, um, it is a, is a long epic piece. And there is a section that we're focusing on particularly where Roland, who is a retainer of the King of France, um, the King of France, Charles and, and his army, including Roland and several of his, his nobles and retainers were in, um, in Moorish Spain and had been fighting for, for some time before heading, this is Charles, Mont uh, Charles the Hammer. Uh, during their, the, the, it's not the Reconquista, the Reconquista is later, sorry. Um, they had, they'd been fighting in Spain and the idea was that they had, they had sort of uh, cemented a ceasefire at the very least. And the French army is, is marching back and left in the rear guard is Roland, um, who had volunteered for this because it was, it was expected of him, but also because he's been placed in a, in a position of ambush. Some of the other retainers under King Charles are not happy with how, how good Roland is, uh, and they want to make sure that he suffers. So we're framing this as Jure, seeing a job that needs to be done, volunteers to remain with the rear guard, much like Roland does. Um, so we know our duty to stand here for our king. A man must bear some hardships for his lord, stand everything, the great heat, the great cold, lose the hide and hair on him for his good lord. Um, when I wrote this, Jure still had some hide and some hair. Uh, now let each man make sure to strike here and let them not sing a bad song about us. And this is, this is that text that is the decision with Roland staying. This is the decision where Jure stays. And so Jure went forth on his good swift running war horse. Again, this text brings us to some of our elements, right? The men of Ontir, the, the men of the West and the men of Ontir, um, and no king of Ontir. So that we're constantly re reinforcing that this is a story that takes place in our world in our society. Um, oh, did I skip right past the part where they get ambushed? 
we're good. Uh, uh, so the battle is feel for fearful. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of, of weaving in very small elements. So in most period stories, uh, the, the, the focal point items are named, of course, right? We see lots of examples of that in, in many different kinds of texts. So we needed to come up with a name for Jure's sword. It's called Yale because at the time he had performed for many years the Office of Silver Yale. And these are just these little pieces that you can throw in that make it feel like it's SCA, but also real. So a lot of this text is, is, is repackaged and realigned so that we still have almost the same narrative, almost the same plot. We have a heroic figure with his, his, his portion of the army left behind, ambushed this time by the dastardly West instead of the Saracens. Um, actually, I'm not sure if anyone in the West has, has seen this and had any problem with it. That's a good question. Um, but I'd like to get right down to the part where, where things change, where this is not the story of Roland anymore. So Jure, this is a, this is fit 10. Um, Jure knows that this is true and that it is his duty to protect the king. Even with a warning and a confession, his job is left undone. He puts Oliphant to his mouth. I did not rename the, the horn because I think Oliphant's such a great name. Um, and now the mighty effort of Jure, the sergeant, he sounds his Oliphant, his pain is great. And her, from his mouth, the bright blood comes leaping out and the temples burst in his forehead. This is parlayed into Roland dying epically, heroically in the story. I avoid that part because Jure is okay. Um, but they heard it 30 leagues away. The king heard it in his faithful men. And the king said, I hear Jure's horn and he'd never sound it unless he had had a battle. Because in, in both the Song of Roland and in the Song of Jure, there is a moment of, uh, of indecision. Is this a moment where our hero needs help? And more importantly, is this a moment where our hero will accept that he needs help and ask for it? Roland does not ask for help in time. And that's where Jure's song is different because he does. Jure knows the power of help. The king commands the horns to sound and high in the hills. All of this is, is beautiful text that I was able to, again, repackage and, and retain from some of the original. Um, but I'd like to get down to the part where we start to weave in more of our SCA elements. Um, so the, the language of the battle is again, very, very similar to the, the original text. Um, so here we are in 14, um, Sergeant Jure removes his shattered, shattered shield, his broken mail. He sees his lion's belt and knows it will be taken from him. What's a lion's belt? Does anyone want to talk about that? That'd be, uh, he was a sergeant for Lionsgate at the time. Absolutely, that's his sergeant's belt. So we're just, we're starting to weave in subtle SCA elements and, and making it more and more uh, uh, interconnected. Um, he sees his lion belt and knows it will be taken from him. Margaret was the Baroness who gird you about me and with my sword and you my helm and book, because of course he is a learned man. There's no mention of Roland owning any books or having any books in his story, but I know that Jure is, is a better person than that. Uh, I knelt for Lionsgate, that land where men are free. I served secret in every field of Hartwood. I ministered for Danescombe and Thornwood. With them, I provisioned Fjordland and Lionsdale. All of these I did for my barony, my principality, and my kingdom. And now I am released from my oath and my duty, and Sergeant Jure unwinds the belt from his body. So this is tying in the real world events, the real world efforts and toil that Jure had done. The wind carries this belt and carry, uh, takes the belt and carries it through the valley. And boistered by the, the voice of a thousand new trumpets fresh from the wood come banners bearing fresh blazons. The lions and their gate march in stretching numbers. This is his home barony coming to respond to the horn, answering the call of the Oliphant. A shimmering black whale crests over a hundred helms. This is the other barony of Tyri and Antir, Sigurd coming to return the, the, the work and the, the blood that Jure had given for them. Freshly coated in sea spray and answering the call of the Oliphant, hearts and rams, which are some of the heraldic beasts that we have in the branches discussed earlier, laurel wreaths, which heraldically is the reserved charge for a branch in the SCA, and a menagerie of beasts, leading men in the thousands, all waving proud, all answering the call of the Oliphant, coming to return the service because service is exactly what was 
what was pinnacleized here. So we cut through some of this stuff where we're talking about um, elements of the West, uh, the Principality of Sinagua, um, having a little bit of uh, the waters of the mist, the Principality of the Mists, having some of these SEA geographical elements makes, uh, makes the connection between our real events, our, um, our, our pretend society, and the, the way that things were referenced in period a little bit more interwoven. And then here we have uh, at the end, the, the sort of culmination and the, um, the Aristea, right? This moment of, of most heroism and what heroism looks like for somebody like Jure. Um, when the king sees all of the dead West, many struck down the great masses of them drowned. He gives thanks that their ambush was defeated and their enemy gone. But even more, he gives thanks to Sergeant Jure uh, that, that Sergeant Jure stands battered, bare of helm and shield, stripped of his belt, but alive. He gives thanks to the assembled hundreds who came to return the service Jure had rendered. Again, repeating this language that it is it was given and is now being given back by the masses for him. Um, and on his will at their recommendation and in light of his duty, the king grants Sergeant Jure an elevation to make him a master and a companion of the pelican. So this was a text that I was able to take from a period source and I was able to make and uh, create a presentation that glorified a, a dear friend of mine. So that was the last slide. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I've gone just a little bit over eight o'clock here. My apologies. But um, I would like to open it up. We can, we can take me off a spotlight. And let's, let's have some folks touch in if they would like to. How much rewriting of the original did you do? That's a fantastic question. Um, I would like to try to find a, a, a shareable resource, but I use the 1978 uh, Frederick Golden translation of the Song of Roland. Um, and there's 45 pages or so um, of text that I was able to trim uh, and repackage with, with the assistance of, of someone at the time. Uh, and yes, it has one word fame. As a matter of fact, that uh, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about this, but I, I guess I can. Um, last year, I, I discovered that there is a, a series of awards in the SCA for content that is published in newsletters. And one of the things that was published in, in our local Barony newsletter, the Northwind, was a, a copy of the Song of Jure, uh, Les Chassons de Jure. And it won, it won a compositional award the the William it? Black Fox. Thank you. I was like the William something. Thank you, Black, William Black Fox. Uh, the William Black Fox Award. So I was I was absolutely gobsmacked and touched to to find out that there was an award um, for the sort of thing that I like to do, and that that people thought it was it was worthy of that. Um, and I was very glad that I was able to to meet the challenge that that had been presented to me because once I performed it for him, um, he told me that that I, I did what had been asked. Okay. Um, any other any other questions? Things that we want to we want to bring up and talk talk about. We can we can leave the recording on for a little while. Those of you who are joining us who haven't been to a Lions Den before, um, we can we can leave things going for a little bit. I'm I'm good to to answer some questions and whatnot. And then there may be uh, an opportunity for a, a social conversation afterwards. I haven't made dinner because I was busy making a PowerPoint all day, so I might not stick around forever. Uh, but I am here for for a goodly while as long as as people have stuff that that I can contribute for. Go ahead, unmute yourselves. Hi. <laughs> um, Hi. About the squire to the king. Mm -hmm. As the writer of that film, <laughs> um, there's a couple of stories actually around it. Uh, it was written in the time of Duke Darius. So Ave, Antier, Ave. He was the only one that used that. He is most certainly a super duke, as we call them, and multiple, multiply king of Ontario. Um, and there was a short period where, yes, uh, he would step down and then he would, six months later, win a uh, crown again. And so Squire to the King was written in his honor. Um, I was a little nervous at the time presenting it the very first time I presented it at um, an event where uh, Lancer Brianna 
was actually present uh, doing a one of the first verdict um, judged big verdict things that we were doing at the time trying to elevate uh, bards from fireside into something um, into more how it is where we have our bardic champion. We didn't have that yet. Oh. But, um, and being a little nervous, I chose oh, a break right. instead of presenting it as a contest entry or anything. I chose a break um, where everyone was having lunch and just thought, well, you know, we're in a community. We'll just try this. And uh, I presented the first verse and in the first chorus and uh, Brianna pointed across from me and she says, oh, speaking of, and I looked at her and I looked back the other way where she was pointing. Oh, and there was one of Duke Darius's squires. And it, 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 it became Sir Liam. It was Squire Liam at the time. He was just kind of leaning against the pole. Please continue. <laughs> so that was uh, specifically uh, written for that time, that rain, those that set of rains and of our own tier. Hey, thank you, thank you for providing a little bit of the background. Like I said, I, I knew that it was it was related to on tier. Um, we've we're, we're definitely a kingdom of super dukes, um, but I, I guess I had never connected it to a particular person or a particular reign. That's helpful for me. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think it was well quite a number of years ago hmm. um, before before I think possibly before you joined. And yeah, exactly. Right. We we have that generational sort of cycle, like I was mentioning at the beginning. Um, just to go back to the question over here, we were talking about the the no shit there I was. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the very first story that I presented, hey, sis, the very first story that I presented is a no shit there I was. Um, I I was at a war and no shit, guys, this guy got an, a, something, something messed up with his helmet. And <laughs> we're out there and we're fighting and it was great. And then all of a sudden he's walking off and he's got a great big piece of plastic sticking out of his helmet. That's a that's a no shit there I was story, but with a little bit of repackaging and a little bit of finesse, um, and and a little bit of of amateur artistry, we can make it something that is is still an incredible story and is still a part of our real history, but feels feels a little bit more like a cooler with a piece of fabric draped over it. If that's a if that's an acceptable metaphor, it's a beautiful metaphor. Thank you. And it's actually kind of interesting because listening to you talk about this, particularly with the generational, I'm reminded of the patterns of where we started 40 plus years ago and how the tradition of telling the stories of our friends. And at that point, we mostly did it in song. Yes. So we have the Saxons and the Vikings focusing on Sir Harold of Warrington. Um, there's songs about Duke Paul, uh, the, the biggest one being My Name It Is Duke Paul. Um, we have the ones of the dog meat warriors about the armies of Lionsgate. The pattern repeats. Mm -hmm. And it's nice that this tradition of storytelling has become more formalized and continues. Even if you don't know the people we're telling stories about, it's still a good thing. Continue and, and with the stories. They were, they were still very, sorry, just to jump in. Um, they were still very valuable to me as a newcomer because even though I didn't know these people, it gave me a sense of tone. It gave me a sense of history that there was 40 some odd years of SCA before I showed up. And I, I learned about people by story, whether I ended up ever meeting them or not, whether there was an opportunity to meet the people before they had passed or not, I still got a sense of who these people before me were. And I, I love the idea that, like you said, that there, there's a continuation, what I, what I'm hoping something can come up of tonight is that it can be a conscious continuation because these were, these were not something that I, I tried to intentionally emulate. They were just something that I felt there was a need for, or there was an opening and an opportunity for. I would love to be able to help people write stories of the people who haven't started playing yet, because there, there is going to be a, a, a cycle. There is going to be a sense of generation and gap. The, the two stories that I, I presented first tonight, those people don't play anymore. And I, as I was putting my, my thoughts and my notes together, I realized that my, my best example, my first example uh, um, of the, the sort of arc, archetype that I'm talking about is not something that anyone who started 
recently can connect to. And that puts them right where I was when I started, right? Um, in, in conversations leading up to this, I'm sorry, I didn't get any of your stuff in my PowerPoint, Brianna. Um, there, was, there was this fantastic sense of, of history stretching back long before me. And knowing that that's there is very powerful. Knowing that you can be a part of it, be, be a part of it as an amateur, be a part of it as a hobbyist, be a part of it as somebody who doesn't know everything, but who was there or who knew somebody or who heard a story about a thing and wants to make it a little bit more period wants to pull in something that they had learned from somewhere else, something that they had learned um, in, in reading or writing or sitting around a bardic fire, combining those different elements so that there is something real, there is something period, and there is something SCA involved, can tie a lot of that stuff together. Um, and I would like to see it, it happen a lot more. I'll be happy when somebody tells a story about me. Kidding, kidding, kidding. One of the things that's sort of nice too is in our in our bardic tradition is that we don't tell stories necessarily just about the people, but we talk about SCA situations. And I'm thinking of um, a lot of the work of um, just blanked on his name, um, the the gentleman who wrote the Burden of the Crown, mm -hmm. um, who talked so much to SCA culture, um, Baldwin of Erebor. Master Baldwin of Erebor, uh, when I was early in the SCA and uh, along with with Elvina, so gosh, 35, 40 years ago, he was the bard. And he wrote things like Burden of the Crown, which um, reduces people to tears mm -hmm. um, with, with its concept of the king passing and, and passing on the crown and the kingdom to his successor. Um, it's beautiful. Things like the faded rose, which is slightly humorous. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but he talk he he talks about aspects of culture, not necessarily in in terms of the creation of heroes, but stories that explain why we are. And I think that that touches really nicely back to that that sort of subdivision that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, for 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 academics and scholars and, and anthropologists, there is there are subtypes of stories. Um, to call everything that we looked at today a myth is disingenuous. Um, these are these are really these are these are legends. These are things that happen in reality that we've put a great ton of narrative fiction on top of. Um, and it, I think one of the, the funniest or one of the most interesting re, uh, thoughts that I have for that Kushag is that I've heard that performed. I had no idea who wrote it. And I think that it's the creation of culture and that culture and that background and that milieu is so important to what we do. But I think it's a little bit different. I think that in in the in the creation not just of, of heroes but in the creation of narratives and stories that we tell about specific people or specific events we are we are creating our uh, narratized history yeah if that if that makes any sort of sense it does um, it just make you know I, I i brought it up to to point out that it is another way that we create create ourselves you're absolutely right, and not not to be downplayed. No, 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 not it's, it's important. It's, yeah. a, it's it's just a different a different mechanism of creating culture and community. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, and I think that there, because I've I've heard multiple people perform that. It's possible because it's there. It is a little bit more removed, and there is the possibility of encountering it now, maybe without citation, maybe without authorhood. Um, people may feel a little bit more freer performing it, possibly because it's a song, people feel a little bit more freer. Oh, it. When, when, it, when it was first written, it was performed everywhere. And I think that's one of the things that's a little different here is, is we don't often see different performers telling a story or a song that somebody has written about a real person, possibly because there's, there's no sense of, of permission, there's no, um, there's no comfort. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to see, you know, I would love to see Chavez or 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 Brianna or somebody close to Jure in, in his household tell that story. I know that they're not gonna. Uh, she doesn't want to. Um, but I, I I would love to see. Okay, neither of them. Um, it's just you and me, brother. Uh, I'll 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 tell love stories about you all night. Um, I think it's really important that we we share the texts. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that everything that I've written has shown up on the, the, the Ontario Wikipedia, because as much as I'm proud of having composed them, I know that I didn't compose them in a vacuum. And I know that my performance is not the only, nor should it be the only performance of it. 
I want more people to tell these stories. If nothing else than to, to, to share the word fame of the people that I put effort into creating more fame for. If we don't tell the stories, the stories get lost. Exactly, exactly. If you're telling it, then it, it, it's being told. It's not right or wrong, Loki. I think that's such an interesting point to make because, um, so maybe I'll, the, I'll turn the camera on now that I'm talking. Um, hey man, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I was in garbage. So I wanted to stay off camera. Um, sure. No, it's such an interesting point to make because, so, you know, currently, because the pandemic never ends, I'm still technically Keen Keenan Bard, which means I still get to hear all the kingdom stories and stuff around Theora and get to sit in, in all those discussions on those matters. But I have only been in the society for, I think at this point, it's been three years now. So I don't know most of these things that people are talking about. I don't know, like, like, like very little of this holds any of that personal importance to me that it does to so many other people. And so I hear people tell stories and say things, and it's, it so much depends on somebody sharing that bit of importance from themselves and from their perspectives to carry that importance for newer generations. And now that we're having more and more people aging out of the SCA and younger people coming in, um, there's even more precedence to have those stories in rotation. The plea I would have though, is not to just, you know, as, as you say, like not, don't just share them, like have them available for other people to tell because otherwise it doesn't really, it doesn't really serve a purpose if, you know, if you're going to always tell the story, that, that's great. And, you know, that we come to expect you're always going to tell the story, right? But if you don't teach the story to other people, they're not going to be able to tell the story. That story is going to get lost because it's going to end with you as well. Uh, that's uh, that, uh, The song that was coming to mind when we were talking about this was Born on the List Field and that whole song and its tradition and what have you, you know, finding out that apparently it was in my kingdom was where it was originally written, like, you know, and like, the story behind it and how it's evolved and how it went from a totally oral song to now it's it's supposed to be recorded in as many different ways as possible. Everyone's supposed to basically have their own version recorded in their own bard book. And it's just interesting to me to see that evolution of what would have been a period practice of bardic in our modern era. Uh, and so it's really cool to see First, I'll see the process behind this. I mean, I greatly appreciate you walking through how you wrote these things in the first place. Um, but also like to hear you championing for people to share these things, because oftentimes I see, like I said, like it often dies with the person who wrote it or they, they, don't, they don't share their story to have someone else tell. It's, it's their piece. They're gonna perform their piece because they're well known for their piece, not here's my piece let me teach it to a your generation so they can share my piece forward born on the list field is particularly interesting and i expect in 200 years there's going to be a child ballad version a uh, book of 900 versions that have been collected of born on the bloody list field and that would be epic that would be amazing that would be i, I would love to see the stuff that we have in our hands and in our mouths right now last right uh, Tenok, you, you brought it up an, an incredible point or this idea that if we do not perform, we do not share, we lose it. I want to I want to modify that thought just ever so slightly because one of the things I was thinking about as I put my stories together to, today is is not just the idea that we will lose them, but that we will lose the impact. We will lose we will lose the personhood of it. I I can I can describe to you what Dana was like. I can describe to you who he was as a person. And I, I hoped that I wove some of that personality and that character and that individuality and uniqueness and personhood into the story. But unless I share that part of it, that part's not gonna translate over to the next person. None of us have met King Arthur. We do, however, have thousands of versions of text that tell us what he may have been like. Um, that, I, mean, I agree with, I agree with that. I've seen, <laughs> oh, oh, so sorry, I'll, I'll no, uh, yeah. No, 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 I, I was just making oh. a joke, it's okay. Also, I wanna oh, say oh. this is fantastic that I started my presentation with I'm not an expert and I have two kingdoms. <laughs> no, I was gonna say um, that like, I think that's such a good point too, because you know, I've witnessed so much bad bardic where someone tells a story or says a song 
and I'm supposed to care about it because apparently it's important. But like none of that importance is conveyed. It's supposed to be based on word fame alone. Like I'm supposed to care just because it's about an important person. That person doesn't mean anything to me. I've never met that person. I don't know. I don't know anything about them. I mean, how am I supposed to care about this if you don't actually make me care about it? Like you yourself as a performer sharing the story, if you don't con you don't convey that actual feeling and emotion, there's that's that's actually an issue we're writing into in our kingdom. Well, trying we're trying to create better bard resources for newer bards, and yeah. there's so many pieces that people keep telling us are important, and we're like, okay, but why? Because like if you like, no offense, but if you ask me, it's not that great of a song. So like, why yeah. should I? Like, why is it an important song to add to the root to the resource to the compendium? You're absolutely right, because there there is that the 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 community building and the connection that I talked about earlier. That is almost the purpose or the intent behind why we tell these stories of of ourselves. Right. Um, sometimes it's a really cool event. Sometimes there's a thing that you want to make sure that people don't forget about, like this dude getting an arrow in the eye. Um, but the reason we tell these stories, the intent, the purpose, the only reason to listen is because these people were real and these people mattered to some of us who are here, hopefully. And if, if we can't share that with the rest of the group, you're right, that can be bad bardic. Although in my eyes, the only kind of bad bardic is bardic that takes too long. <laughs> um, try to keep, always keep it nice and short. Um, Sorry, there was another point that I had as this conversation was interplaying and I lost it, my apologies. Okay, I actually need to say something because there's there's something that came up in um, in something that you just said and that Tanoff just said uh, regarding the real people thing. Um, when you take a piece that is historical and you rewrite or reframe it, um, you are interfering with the transmission of history. And so there's a responsibility to acknowledging what you're doing. And um, I, have, I have a qualm about the, the Chanson de Jure, which is why I will not perform it. Because uh, if the, ooh, how do I put this? We've now gotten to the point where we only read the Song of Roland in translation. We only read it, it is never performed. It is not something that, well, not never, but so rarely performed that you're not going to find a performance of it on YouTube. Um, and so uh, it, is, it is entirely possible that your version of that story, although it's been reframed and you've taken Jure, you've taken Roland out and put Jure in. And you know, um, this is the reason I asked that question, how much did you do? Because um, there's that line between uh, being inspired by a piece and, very clearly carbon copying bits of it and going, I like this whole verse, this is good, we'll just change that name and this name. That's really problematic. And it's something that if we're going to be um, looking at a way of continuing our culture and our history and our legends, uh, we need to be very careful of, we need to be very conscious of. I have read both the Song of Roland and your Chanson de Jure, and I find them too close. They're just on that line of, I'm like, no, no, nope, nope, too close. Um, you kept in the beautiful poetry, but you've changed the names. And that's, that's a changing of history. And that if your version survives because somebody records you or somebody else doing it and it ends up on YouTube and that ends up preserved and we lose the song of Roland, what's the cost there? So that's something I, I, don't, I don't even think there's an answer to it. I just want people to be thinking about it when they're doing this kind of compositional uh, or celebratory work. I, I would. If I, if I can, I'm going to respond with two, two parts. First off, you're, you're not wrong. I have made um, as, many, as many pains as I can up to and including making sure that I was properly covered for copyright into submitting it for the Bardic War mm -hmm. to make it abundantly clear that this is not an original creation, that this relies heavily on something that was already composed and exists in reality and needs to be respected and cherished. But let me ask you a hypothetical. In the future where there is no Song of Roland, there is just the Song of Jure. The fact that the song of Jure exists is a plus then. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because at the very least in bastardized form. We kept something. <laughs> there's some piece of it still remains. Yeah, some of that poetry. And then you get some scholar 300 years in the future, 3000 years in the future reading over going, it's really interesting because this is clearly like late 20th century and this is really clearly not. So where did they get this from? And I, I, would, be, I would be so overwhelmingly joyed if I, I have created the kind of, of fuckery that you see in trying to unpack the academia of something like Beowulf, where they're like, wow, 
I wonder why that cross is in there all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very valid and it is period. Yeah. I, I do, yeah, it's, it, I have a whole thing about bad filking and um, this, it, this doesn't, this is not anywhere in the same, this is none. You're, that's the sub basement, you're on the second floor. You're like, but you're... but I, I think you're right that as, as artists and as historians who respect where it comes from, it is our, our responsibility to make sure that at no point do I ever present this as, as something that is coming from, from my fear, right? Yeah. Like this is, this is yeah. something that I was, I was lucky enough to be able to, to um, reframe. Yeah. Right. I, and I like that you were you acknowledge this is a rewriting of a history. It, it, I have to because it would be like disingenuous. It, uh, it would it, it's the height of, of artistic plagiarism otherwise. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that was I, it is really good. I can't uh, act old enough it's okay good. to use his text, right? Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for pointing that out. For for all of you who are watching this recording later, please, when you use period elements, period sources, cultural ideas, especially texts that are extant. Do not pretend they're yours. They're not yours. We are blessed to be in an age that has academic integrity and has access to the kinds of databases that has never been true before in history. That gift is something that we can, we can play with and we can play with it in our sandbox, but do not take it out and try to pretend that it's yours. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Always, hopefully. The thing about Filk is you have to acknowledge where you got the sources from. And if you acknowledge your sources, playing with it, well, that goes way back to when they started retelling Gilgamesh in different versions. And that's over 4,000 years old, at Absolutely. least. Absolutely. So we've been doing this a long time, retelling our stories and reframing them and lifting from the people before us. But acknowledge where you're coming from. I it's think that's what you were saying. If the SEA that, is the is period as it should have been, right? Where we should have been citing our sources. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just because we've been doing it for four thousand years doesn't mean we shouldn't be better and about we, doing yeah, it. Yeah, we get to do we get to do it a little bit better and a little bit differently. Now, I kind of want to read this thing and perform it as best I can. Yeah, absolutely, Loki. I'd love to be able to share the text with you. Um, once I once I unpack it, I'm sorry, I'm still in mid move. This is an excellent conversation. I'm so glad that there are so many engaged people who are here. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. So Brianna, where, where would you put our um, collegiums? Uh, Genghis is a coming in. Oh God, that was such genius. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, we acknowledge that that was a total rewrite of summer. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna to pause. I do have a, another question here. Would, would you like to type it in or, or would you like to, to tell us what your question is? Avon? I'll type it. Okay. Okay. I will keep an eye on the chat. Sorry for interrupting everyone. No, I've, I've done um, silks of, of um, period pieces. Mm -hmm. And I've done um, originals. Originals. Orient chants, translations <laughs> of certain drinking songs. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, you, you even with those, you, you can say, yes, it's an original composition, but it's based on this style. Absolutely. Right? Even there, you claim it, you know, it's, it's not something that you created. It's something that you are looking back on. And, and if possible, we should always try to talk about the influence as well, as, as well right? The, the arming sequence that I have in, in Dana Koika really was modeled after, after the, the, the sort of extracts and excerpts that I was reading in the Iliad at the time I was in class while I was writing it. Um, I, I'm a sponge of influences always, always coming in. Um, and depending on what I've been reading or what I've seen performed, um, that that often, yeah, just ring just ring me out because I'm so damp right now, Jerry. Um, those influences will always show up in my work, and it's my obligation to try to be as aware and cognizant of them, and to make sure that I'm clear with my my performance and my audience. Uh, just sorry to go back to the question. So that means that this needs to be preserved just in case. Um, just so that I'm clear, what is it that this this is? Uh, this this Zoom session tonight, our bardic performances, um, our our society and, and our collective history together. I guess I could I could 
theoretically answer all three pieces. Yes, um, this evening's session is recorded and I'm very glad that it's gonna be put up on the YouTube. Um, hopefully many people will, will review it later. Um, there are some links that I, I would have loved to have been able to put in my PowerPoint, but I'm gonna share the PowerPoint on the Barony of Lionsgate's Facebook and hopefully on the website as well so that people can get access to these resources. And as soon as I do that with a little bit of extra time after tonight, I'm going to throw Brianna's stuff in there as well. I'm going to throw some of Jazzy stuff in there as well, um, because I did I did try to do my due diligence and get a, a wide sample for this evening, and it took me way too long to put my PowerPoint together. Classic teacher. Um, if if this is to refer to the stories that we tell, absolutely preserve them. Preserve them, but feel free, especially the ones that that I compose or the ones that I, I I'm open to sharing to others. Um, preserve them in your own way. If you are a memorizer and you would like to cement these into mem rote memory, feel free. That's fantastic. If you are at a bardic fire and you're taking notes, that's incredible too. Go and talk to the performer afterwards and see how they feel about you sharing their art or you sharing their art, their, they, them sharing their art with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we, we're in a historical society. And one of the things that, that we have on our predecessors is a variety of, of methods for recording information, whether it's in oral tradition, whether it's in written tradition, um, whether it is literally a video recording like this. We, we owe it to those who come after us to try to carry as much of what we've brought with us to this moment forward. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, I know you said it, but I just wanted to reiterate that if you are uh, wanting to preserve and perform the pieces that you didn't write, make sure it's okay with the writer or composer of those pieces. Um, anything that I put on the internet, I personally, and I will put this on everything as a disclaimer, I am personally okay with anybody performing. If I've put it out there, I'm saying it's okay, but that's me. And not every composer, not every songwriter, not every storyteller, has the same kind of leeway. I will also not put specific pieces out there. I will keep those for me. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and thank you, because that's a fantastic example of making both choices for one person. That's a great example. I, I can't think of much that I have that I wouldn't share, but it is just as acceptable and just as valid and just as fair for somebody to say, actually, I would perform it to be performed by myself only. If it is something that somebody has created, then they are the ones who have ownership of it regardless of what, what principality or kingdom or legal jurisdiction that you're in, there are always going to be different copyright laws that you would need to be following mundanely. But as, as artists and as peers in a society, we need to respect the fact that people get to choose what happens to the things that they create. Now, for something like, uh, you know, Bird in the Crown, I, I wouldn't have necessarily known who to go and ask, but I may have been around a fire often enough that I've heard multiple people perform it. Maybe I've heard- Derek Foster is a mundane name. Totally fair. My point is I may have heard multiple people performing it and I may have heard somebody performing it more than once. That's the touchstone to go and say, hey, who did you learn it from? Because it's possible that that information is not recorded, but it is orally transmitted. Do your due diligence. Find out what you can about a thing before you perform it. I would never want to tell a story that turned out was a satire of some horrible event. <laughs> um, if, if, if you didn't actually know Dana and you thought he lost his eye, that would be a very different story. <laughs> so always, always do your, your checking as well, because that's a part of our responsibility and our, our, our privilege to find out the background behind these pieces of, of, of text or, or performances. And yeah. if I can add, if you do find mm -hmm. that, the, that the owner of the piece wants to keep for their own performance, for God's sake, encourage them to record it so it's not lost. Possible. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it still allowing a little bit of leeway for the idea of the ephemeral piece, the piece that is designed to be lost, because that can have a certain kind of power and, and gravitas to it itself. But I would hope that most pieces are not like that. We, we would hope to keep that as an exception because that, um, that sense of loss is, is valid and can be created with an artistic intent, but we don't want to lose what we don't have to. But even within the SCA and the 50 odd years since it started, we've lost things because the technology for recording has changed so much in the time that Kushag and I have been in the SCA. I mean, our early stuff, when we were printing things down, they were done on Gestetners. 
Yeah, the North Wind was done on, we were talking about that, a fight practice on yeah. Tuesday night. The North Wind was done on Gestetner. And we remember the North Wind work sessions where we all went in and we had our typewriters and we had that horrible plastic correcting fluid that you had to use. And you, then you had, you typed everything up in, in its spot and then you sent it over to the artists to use their little scalpels to carve the pictures. I would love to hear a story about the first North Winds where you are all monks. <laughs> sitting in a strip for you. That's genius. No, but, but just, in, just in the method and, and the, the formation that we were talking about this evening, right? Taking that real world event, taking the intent of what we were supposed to be pulling from it, and then putting a little bit of layer foundation uh, uh, period style on top of it, right? The very first North Winds were produced by by a set of, of uh, students, of monks. Religion, um, nuns and, and monks. And they... <laughs> Because that, that I, that's almost. This is going to sound terrible. That's almost as old to me as as a, a some. Like a Stettner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like a mimeograph. Because, because I don't have that tactile kinesthetic experience with those things. I know that they're not nearly as old. Yeah, actually, but, I think some of the earliest ones were done on a ditto. Which is, is only just like it's a word to me. I can't even picture oh. that. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's the like I know they exist producing. in the in the sort of the the, the timeline of, of technology and devices. I know of them, but but the reason I brought up the North Wind was because it was one of our few concrete ways of sharing stories. Mm -hmm. The very early North Winds have our stories of the early days of Lionsgate in them. That's where the stories were put down and shared and transmitted. That's actually one thing that um, is no longer done uh, in publications or that maybe is done but very rarely and you'll see examples of it in the 25th year um, on a Lionsgate book is chronicling events and that's actually a way in which those heroic moments and those um, that it's a combination of cataloging the history of the people and the culture of the area um, was that we would chronicle events someone would chronicle not just what happened at court but, you know, so-and-so so entered this competition and they didn't win, but they came second and they did an epic thing. And we would actually do that. And we have lost some of that in the digital age, um, but it is part and parcel of what you're talking about because it's a chronicle like the annals, you know, and, and those other, they're just like one paragraph, but it, yeah. you have a name there. You have a, you have a piece there. This, this person was real. This, this person thing, was real. This thing was real. It or even the gossip columns are in the old Northwinds are where I like to go. Fair. And, and when, when <laughs> no. we talk about when so we talk so about what being... happened, these people had a child, right? There they are. <laughs> oh, Jerry's there with my Ian Nasir. Yes. Um, love me and Ian Nasir. Always, always good quality copper. Um, when we talk about these things being lost, it's it's not always that they're lost, it's that they they haven't been brought forward with us. And that takes time, that takes effort. Um, and, and we are a volunteer organization that cannot always dedicate that. But I would, I would like to see it happen just as much as we have, um, you know, Eric making parties. Uh, I would love to see scanning parties. Um, I'm just gonna touch on a couple of things real quick because I had a question here. Um, where, where do the song books count in this? That's a great question. Um, I, I do not have a song book. I'm not an expert to be able to discuss that. My understanding is that the songbooks were collected and shared um, and that usually you had one very diligent, very industrious bard who would experience different things around fires, would talk to other performers and practitioners and would collate all of those, those pieces. Um, I, I'm not much of a singer. Uh, my propensity to take dramatic pauses do not generally vibe well with music. Uh, you just haven't found your genre yet. It's true. Chanting songs, very simple beats. <laughs> well, Bri Brianna, you put together the um, the Thierry songbook, correct? I had no part of that project. That was Azure and Gregor. Ah, which um, was, what was the one that you did then? Um, I was working on the Bardic Registry of Volunteer, which is actually registering the bards and what instruments they play, what performance styles they have. And I did that before the internet was a thing. And I don't recommend anybody ever try that again without the internet. It was, yeah, it was, it was a long hard. four years of my life, let me tell you. <laughs> exceptionally hard. Um, Evan, to, to answer your question, it, it's, it seems like maybe there is not a, a universal style. Um, I, I would love to hear from Tanak to see what, what his sort of experiences are with songbooks. Um, 
I can I can only comment on what I've seen in my part of One Kingdom, um, and it's it's not something that I've I've thrown myself very greatly into. Uh, um, I mean, if you if you want me to talk about, it, I could tell you how we've done ours real quickly, at least. Sure. So yeah, just to, to get an intra kingdom anthropology. Um, so we have what's called Voices of the Star, which is the un unofficial Anstar Bard book that was made. Uh, I want to say. 15-ish years ago by several former Kingdom Bards at the time. Um, it was their kind of pet project was they got together and, you know, this was back when things were a little bit more intimate as far as like people definitely did know everybody and what have you before the Kingdom grew to the point where it is at now. Um, so like all the Kingdom Bards were very well acquainted, knew each other quite well. It, it was very close-knit community. Um, they got together, they put it together. Most of the works, though, are theirs or were from other kingdom bards. So it was almost always champion bards. And that's actually part of the acknowledgement at the beginning was they acknowledge all of the, bar the, the, the kingdom bards at the time, as well as the champion bards in, in every barony, because it was really just their, I don't want to say it was just their work, but it was primarily their work. Mm -hmm. that was being featured in the, in this piece, uh, as well as the fact that almost everything there was patriotic to answer of some sort or fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that was kind of, because they were mimicking a little bit what Kalantir does, with because Kalantir has a, Kalantir has very well, I mean, everyone probably has a copy of Kalantir's songbook because that's a, that's a songbook that gets passed around a lot. I learned a lot of pieces through that, as opposed to- um, No one is unsure before. how Karen Kalantir fears about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean like so i think a lot of it was it was being based off of what Kalantir was doing with their stuff there's been an effort to make like a volume two it just keeps growing it keeps dying it keeps growing it keeps dying we fortunately have some very good people working on it now so i think this time they've done a pretty good job of creating it and the intention now is specifically uh which i prefer is not to uh not to basically immortalize the works of people that are prominent but their goal right now is to create a resource for newcomers specifically, nice. which I think I prefer that because as, an, as someone who was fairly new and having to learn the ropes, I would much more benef benefit from something like that. And also as someone who's always just kind of looking for like entryways into Bardic for those that have never, don't feel comfortable with it, having something that, that can be an accessible thing, uh, an accessible first step is, is, is good. So those are kind of like the two approaches we've had. Um, it's like I said, it, it's it's one of those things where I don't feel we've had really good unification on, and it's always been the pet project of someone. It's not unlike what you said, where there was a there was one bar that was like, "I'm going to make this my mission," and that was that was their Laurel project or whatever <laughs> <laughs> was putting this together. Yeah. Um, so I think I, th I think that's how we've done it. I know other kingdoms have done it different ways. It's also a little easier uh, and there's like a little tm and i won't say the rest because we're being recorded but it's a little easier when there's a certain attitude of what kind of bardic is wanted and i'm just going to leave it at that comment and everybody who knows knows what we mean by those kind of things <laughs> i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that and and sort of widen it out because i think i think what you're i'm very glad for that perspective and and the ability to say oh yeah there is some sort of commonality in the way um it seems to have been done um for for anyone who is interested in creating their their own songbook. I, I want to caution as sort of an overriding theme of my entire talk tonight that Bardic does not belong to any one person. Um, stories do not belong to any one person except for the people that they're about or the people who wrote them. <laughs> Everyone else has equal access to them. Um, oh, good night. Um, similarly, if you are if you're doing it in a respectful way and in a way where you're acknowledging where they come from, there is no expectation that you be a champion bard or a kingdom bard or even someone who calls themselves a bard to collect songs, to collect pieces. There is, there is no reason why you cannot be a part of that. I think one of the reasons why we, we so often see um, kingdom level bards or champion level bards or bards associated with royalty doing this is because of the level of access that they can have or the level of experience and background that they currently uh, um, bring to the project. But it would be it would be wonderful if everyone had their own storybooks, if everyone had their own songbooks, the pieces that they like, um, the pieces that they like to perform, uh, or maybe the pieces that they like to ask other people to perform, because these are the ways that we collect the culture and the entertainment and the art. Right? I have art on my wall that I have not created. 
I did not need to be a painter to get them, but I can appreciate them. And you can have your own set of, of stories and texts and songs. It doesn't have to be a kingdom songbook to be a, a set of songs collected within a kingdom. In the early days of Lionsgate, when we had the the uh, our, our, the minstrel mm -hmm. was our was our sort of collection of bardic singing, and we all basically wrote down the words to what we were singing. So I still have my original book of things or things that people gave us. You know, Karen when Karen Murphy would say, "Here's a new song, and this is how it goes," and she'd distribute printed sheets of the words. Music, no. Words, yes. I've still got my two binders worth. Very yeah. Cool. Um, I know my original copy of uh, Songs of Wine, Women, and War, which was published before I joined the Society early in, in uh, AS 13. So it predates that. Mm -hmm. And that's got, you know, the dog beat song. That's got, um, or maybe it's about the same time as I joined then, um, the dog meat song, Lionsgate you know, our original thing. But mm -hmm. the thing is too, is that we're also, now that we're that much further on, we're losing the bards too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Daffodup Maran, who was one of the co-writers of Lionsgate is no longer with us. And in terms of writing it, now you all you have to do is ask Nikolai because we can't ask Daffod anymore. Right, right. And that's, that's where it, it becomes so important for us to have a, a sense of context of, of original creation. Um, when when we tell stories or when we we talk about the original authorhood behind something, um, making them people and not just names, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Edward Ziffrin wrote the champion. He's gone now. We lost him last year. Right. Melissa Kendall co-wrote um, Glory, in the melody. Mm -hmm. They um, she and Adele used a poem by a lady down in the West, I believe, as the text. She's gone now. And those those pieces and performances are valuable. And the knowledge of the people who are still around, who knew the people involved, are valuable. Yeah. Those need to have their own space and their own sense of respect and, and recognition. Um, if, so if, if you've got, if you got me and my guitar around a fire sometime, you can ask for glory. You can ask for a uh, right. champion. You can ask for burden of the crown. I always do them up at, uh, at Clinton every year because I like to see uh, banjo cry. And I think that's one of the things that we need to remember as performers and bards is that, as Tanak said, it's, it's our responsibility to create that emotional connection. I was not lucky enough to meet Gerhard. I have heard stories of him, and some of them are more evocative than others. Some of them gave me a sense of who he was as a man. Some of them gave me a sense of who people saw him as. And those are, those are different and varied and valuable, but they need to be given to somebody who never met him, right? Baron Gerhard is a title. The stories that I've heard make him a person. So we yeah, won't sure that we're always doing a that. Gerhard story with you then. This was a conversation I overheard at attorney. Um, how, if any of you know Sir Sam Shieldbait, you'll know that he was around from a fairly young child and he started fighting at about 14. And um, Sir Edward Ziffrin, Viscount Sir Edward Ziffrin, Master and Master. Of Sir Eddie's memorial fame. Of, of Sir Eddie's memorial fame. Uh, well, Sir Edward was my knight's knight. So I have a personal connection to him. But he had a, he had a habit of appearing older than he was. And he would hobble into a fight practice with his armor on his back using his sword as a cane, basically taking in all the young ones who didn't know him and were gonna feel the bite of that sword later. But he came over at this, at this uh, tournament to Kendall and he looked up at, at Gerhard and he said, God, Kendall, I just fought a kid half my age. And Gerhard turned to him and said, well, Ed, you take your age and Sam's and add them together, you get mine. That is that is a fantastic anecdote. It hits all of the beats that I was talking about today. It's nice and short. It gives us a sense of personality and individuality. It's a it's a it's an experience that every single one of us can connect to. And if you can't connect to it yet, just wait. <laughs> <laughs>
and it, it gives us it gives us personhood, <laughs> right? Thank you for sharing that because that's a fantastic example. Now, if we could figure out a way to put it in a pseudo period format and style and we could tell it around a bardic fire, then it wouldn't just be a story of people we knew in the SCA. It would be a story of someone from history. What a great thank class, Kev. What a great thank class. Thank you. Um, and, and again, thank you. It, it, it's, gone, it's gone twice the length that, that it was in presentation because of the exceptional conversation. And I'm very, very glad for that. Um, and I'm glad that it's recorded so that people can, can come and see what we were rambling about later. Um, <laughs> to go back, sorry, to go way back to your, your original comment before I recognized the, the Gaelic, um, I would like to sponsor competitions like this. I would like to see people telling stories about each other. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to when I step back from some of my administrative roles um, is to get back involved into the Bardic community. Uh, I was thinking this morning when I, I was almost sent you a message, Your Excellency, to see if you needed another introduction, Roten, but you did an incredible job um, because I've now I've now done this. I've done a lion's den as Seneschal. I've done a lion's den as a courtier, and now I've finally done a lion's den as a bard. I'm sorry I missed your courtier one. Uh, that was the, the baronial panel. It's recorded. It was wonderful, and it was all about me being servile. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> you're good at that. Servile and historical. As servile as an Irishman can be. Uh, <laughs> That's our that's island. Just, the Duchess Kiva is my word oh, for all of my introductions, or almost all. Uh, no, no, no. The other one that you did for me uh, was was your own words. I remember that distinctly. Oh, the, the, yeah, the cooking, the cooking is the cooking is happening now. I think I'm going to have to run. I think I have written one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Vic, are you still here? Who is currently? I'm here. You're here. Okay. Um, do you want to kill the recording for me? I can do that. Thank you. Thank you.